All right. Good morning. Um, my name is Vasilis Kuzmakos, and I'm here with, please share your name. Uh, Jay Hardman. And today's date is uh, September 20th, tw um, 2021. It is 10.58 uh, a.m. Um, How are you doing today, Jay? I'm doing all right. Fantastic. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is, um, I'm just going to actually describe when and where you were born and describe your family situation. Uh, I was born in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to parents that were originally from New York. Uh, when my father was deployed out to Fort Kit Carson, Colorado in 1955, my mother took me back to New York, where I lived for three years before my family followed my paternal grandfather in the plastics business down to St. Petersburg, Florida, where they had a gas plant. And so I was fortunate to grow up in a fairly cosmopolitan St. Petersburg, uh, you know, as a young person in the service economy. But of course, you know, it was the green bench city. So most of the folks there were retirees, but it was a wonderful place to grow up. Great. So um, what did you do as a career and when did you start? Tell me a little about uh, your journey. Um, well, my career uh, was actually in archaeology. I was a uh, basically a 35-year field archaeologist and, uh, you know, a crew leader in the field and mostly in Florida, but also throughout the southeastern U.S. and the island protectorates of the Caribbean. Um, would you mind uh, elaborating on exactly kind of what you did, any major milestones, any major projects you kind of worked on? Oh, well, <clears throat> I had actually uh, was pursuing... I had received a degree in secondary science ed and was pursuing a degree in vertebrate zoology when I needed social science credit and took an anthropology course and fell in love with the archaeology program and started working in archaeology first, uh, of course, as a grad student. And then Interstate 75 was being moved from my native St. Petersburg over to Tampa right at the time I was and uh, ready to start entering grad school. And I was pulled out to work on the I-75 project as it went around uh, Tampa, east side of Tampa where it is today. And they were popping mammoths and early man out of the ground everywhere. So uh, I was very fortunate, uh, very serendipitous to work on, on one of the major Paleo Indian sites uh, east of the Mississippi River at Harney Flats, which is at the end of the Bush Boulevard, Bullard Parkway, out at Harney Road, where the interstate uh, you know, heads, heads its way down to I-4. Uh, uh, as well as that, I mean, you know, as a, an evolutionary biologist coming in to study the most interesting animal in the forest, I was very fortunate to have all these events happen. And we were worked on many sites where mammoths had been excavated. And then, of course, the human uh, artifacts showed up. But I worked... Uh, I, I was headhunted out off of that project uh, into the first business as archaeology in Florida, Piper Archaeology in St. Petersburg, again, serendipity. And I worked there for many years, uh, but then uh, went to work for a firm down in Sarasota, woman-owned business, uh, and that was um, archaeological consultants worked for them for many years and working all over Florida, incidentally. I mean, I, I basically worked the length and breadth of Florida and working not just in early man, but in every aspect of, of cultural resource management. So everything from historic uh, sites and right on up to, you know, some of these important uh, early man sites, but and everything in between. So um, would you mind describing the type of activities you did in your childhood? So, uh, really, so, how did, so essentially, how did you develop an interest for nature? Was there a specific person or event? Oh, know? well, I, I actually, I mean, I was a troubled child. I, I grew up in the creek, kind of escaping family life. And uh, so I had, I had actually learned all of the creatures, uh, you know, that are, you know, endemic to Florida and in the, especially in the, in the water environment in St. Joseph's Creek commonly known Joe's Creek. It's a major tributary to, uh, to, the, to the Gulf from Pinellas County. And so I, you know, I was, you know, from early age, I, uh, I was just steeped in nature. 
As a matter of fact, I I collected Carolina animals, the little chameleons, and sold those to Doc Webb's uh, drugstore, the, the the pet department in the world's most unusual drugstore. When I was uh, you know between six and eight years old, and and actually went from that to as a thirteen year old started collecting poisonous snakes to sell to Ross Allen at Ross Allen's Reptile Land for two dollars a foot when uh, when the rest of the kids were getting two cents for a soda bottle. So, uh, you know, a little entrepreneurial, but also uh, very, very much involved with with nature. And and uh, I was on the receiving end of some of that nature when I was 16, which ended that career when I was bitten. And so, uh, you know, that brought an abrupt halt, halt to that particular aspect. But, uh, you know, it was that love of nature that, made me excel in biological science in, in school. Uh, and then I matriculated to, uh, in high school and then went to St. Pete college and got my degree in science ed to, you know, ostensibly to teach biology, but then matriculating over to USF didn't want to do both curricula to, to be a high school teacher, you know, cause that was a lot of hours and so forth. So I went to the vertebrate zoology. And, uh, and then I got the Linnaean names for all those critters. That's incredible. So, uh, one second. So, um, one thing, one is, so going, um, circling back to your kind of interest in archaeology, right? Um, how do you believe your background in archaeology has informed the way you interpret modern environmental issues or um, if it has? Oh, um, anthropology in particular, uh, you know, I had always, <clears throat> I'd always been aware of the ongoing degradation of Florida because I, I, you know, I, I surrounded myself with old men, uh, you know, looking for, you know, for models. And they had told me, uh, you know, what it, everyone lamented how it used to be. And then I'd see the old pictures and the stringers of fish and so forth. So uh, I was always uh, attuned to the fact that it was a slow decline happening in Florida, and I was watching it going on around me. And, and indeed, I you know moved into Kennesaw City, which was a major development that was eating up cow pasture when I was six years old, and and watched the infill happen in Pinellas County to where we are today, the most populous, densely populated county in Florida. But uh, the anthropology <clears throat> really locked it in for me when I started doing, you know, the, the population statistics and those kind of things and applying that to Florida. And, uh, you know, it, well, I made some very serious decisions about my own procreation as a result of that. But at any rate, uh, you know, preservation, uh, the heritage preservation was important, but also uh, I was very much interested in, in the natural preservation also, and it was, um, you know, uh, kind of schizophrenic to be working in a field where I was uh, basically the last person that was going to see these gopher tortoises or the last person that was going to see these majestic trees and their orchids and all that, because I knew that, you know, the surveyors came in first, then the archaeologists and the environmental people, and then the bulldozer showed up. And so, uh, you know, that's... Uh, may a culpa a little bit, but I can tell you that, you know, uh, it was a wonderful life to, you know, to, you know, with this sort of sad realist thing going on to, you know, that I was standing in places that were pristine, that were, you know, doomed to development. So to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, um, would you mind describing exactly how the ecosystem has kind of changed in terms of composition and over the course of your lifetime. Well, one need only go to Google Earth and, and you know, to zoom out to see, you know, what's left. And, um, and you know, in many of those, many of those areas and mining, mining interests and, and roads that were to nowhere that are now, you know, you know, every exit has turned into a metropolis and and so forth. So, you know, it's a little, a little discouraging to, um, 
to look at those places and 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 uh, and remember what what they were. Um, but you know, so uh, and and now, of course, I'm I'm in, involved in you know sort of my redemption and trying to create some paradise within the urban setting, and so um, that's how I've gotten you know past you know my my culpability, as it were, in participation in that. So, uh, but yes, as I said, I, you know, I work the length and breadth of Florida. So everything from uh, Three Three Forks Marsh, which is the headwaters of the St. John's River down in the Loxahat, south of Loxahatchee, uh, Pekahatchee Strand, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, just about, any environment that you can think of uh, did a lot of work over at the at the Cape. Uh, surveyed all the land for the shuttle landings uh, site and so forth. Uh, you know, so yeah, some pretty pretty pristine stuff. So, would you mind start? Um, would you mind getting into your background in permaculture um, and how that's kind of influenced you? How did you get involved in it? And oh boy, I could um, bend your ear on this. Um, you know, wh while I was, you know, I became a leader of, of of graduate students in the field who were coming to get their valuable field experience, and the the reciprocity in that was that I was getting the main currents of everything coming out of the university as a field uh, crew chief supervisor. Um, we we mostly, uh, you know, archaeology is a lot like fishing. You know, you do a you do a lot of digging before you actually find something that, you know, so, you, you know, a lot of casting and then, you know, but not a lot of catching. But um, but it was the it was the survey work that was so enriching. You know, it's you know, the excavation is just tedium in the hot sun, you know, and, and discovery also. But the discovery of the sites was the thing that lit me up. And. Uh, and so as these graduate students would come to our CRM firms to get their valuable field experience, you know, we were discussing ideas over these screens. And, and I, you know, having always thought about, you know, this, the slow decline, we would pose the question, how did we get here? And, and move the conversations to that. And how did we go from jungle hut, dangerous in nature, you know, don't go out and tinkle with the jaguar to dangerous in in civilization where we've got temple cities with lots of consumers and temple priests and astronomers and craftspeople and hoi polloi, all consumers. And where did that food come from? So in talking about these ideas, it occurred to me that there had to be a sweet spot just stands to reason if you go dangerous in, in the jungle and dangerous in the city, that there had to be a, a natural evolution of that. And I was coming from, a, from an evolutionary biological background into anthropology where most of my, my colleagues were coming back from history with a little bit more interest in Indian pottery or what have you. So my perspective was a little different. And so I was able to initiate these conversations and then, you know, do a little research. And, and I realized that, yeah, that was an evolution from the jungle hut. And, and then uh, up through this, you know, temple edifice, but there was a long sweet spot uh, where there wasn't a need for a lot of man's inhumanity to man because there was abundance in the jungle. And then as cultural resource management devolved also through my career from heritage preservation to how much don't you want us to find, we'll help navigate you through the labyrinth of cultural resource management, not everywhere, but you know, that's the nature of business. And it was not feeding my spirit anymore. I decided to get out after 35 years and, uh, and came back to my native Pinellas and didn't know what I was going to do here. So I volunteered for hospice organization, and I took uh, I took a job on the full, whole weekend uh, shift back to back shifts on the weekend with Teen Crisis and Runaway, 
And all the while I was doing that, I was thinking about these ideas of the sweet spot and how to replicate that. And I knew that indigenous people are few and far between, not likely to be my teachers in this regard, nor do I have access to them. So I started thinking about, well, who's doing it again? And I started looking around. And at the same time, I was talking with uh, a mentor of mine down in, in St. Petersburg, who had been the president of the Native Plant Society, helped me establish a green team and, and redo all the properties where I was working at this group home when I got pulled upstairs there to work in, in their administration. And, and I was introduced to uh, a fellow who was into permaculture. And then uh, this fellow, this mentor of mine, started a book study group, the Gaius Garden Book Study Group. Gaius Garden is uh, Ken, uh, not Ken, uh, Toby Hemingway. Uh, and it's a guide to home scale permaculture. And we studied that book. And then lo and behold, at Sacred Lands, which is an Indian mound that I'd been affiliated with for many years in St. Petersburg. Uh, it's a uh, Sacred Lands Education and Preservation today my Central Gulf Coast Archaeological Society amateurs and we professionals helped them get that, that nomination to the National Register that allowed them to become a nonprofit, et cetera. So we did do a little preservation here in St. Petersburg. Um, I'm losing the thread here a little bit. Permaculture. Uh, permaculture, thanks. Uh, so I learned that, that uh, there was a course being, being taught there. So I, I went and sat in on the course and took the design course, and, and it was absolutely exactly what I was looking for. And so I finished the course, got, got fairly involved in, in permaculture around the state, uh, helped to form the first permaculture convergence. And, uh, you know, without getting too big ahead, I'm, I'm pretty large and in charge in, in permaculture in general in, in the state. And, uh, so now with this knowledge and this, this capability to do this and realizing also that there's, you know, there's uh, many people uh, deem permaculture to be kind of cultish or whatever. And also, uh, you know, being a social scientist and realizing that if I just put on my tinfoil hat and run back to the world and go, hey, I know a thing, you know, I'd probably be dismissed out of hand pretty quickly. So I decided to do a, a uh, proof of concept and just a track to it. So I went to the Unitarian Universalist church that was a mile from my home. The practicing Hindu minister there had helped me get a, uh, get a, uh, I st also start not in, in addition to the green team at, at the group home setting, I also started a diversity committee. And so I, uh, the practicing Hindu minister at this UU church had gotten me a, Muslim post 9-11 to come and speak to my staff about halal and praying five times a day, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went to talk to him and I said, you have a, a, a retention pond that's full of water back there. It's not draining. And I'd like to maybe do a little experiment back there in perennial agroforestry and create a, an abundance of food that we could just give away. He said, and I told him five minutes of the, of the permaculture idea. He says, we have five acres here. When can you start? And so in a morning on Facebook with my friends in the permaculture group, I did a perma blitz at the Unitarian church to create a garden. And this was just to be a standard sheet mulch bed garden. By 11 o'clock, we had it finished. People came from Newport Ritchie and Bradenton and brought materials. And in the morning, we did a permaculture sheet mulch, planted in it that morning, had the kids come out of the program, and plant marigolds around it. There's a YouTube available, um, Beacon Food Forest Gardens on Facebook. At any rate, uh, 11 years, complete success, uh, planted out in every kind of tropical fruit tree that you can imagine. Uh, there were, before, before COVID came, there were 30 gardens around the periphery of the retention pond. We drained it and created what was happening in the jungle in the middle of this evolution 
from the jungle hut. And I could elaborate on that, but I don't know how much time you have. Um, yeah, by all means, talk about it a little bit more. Well, uh, again, speaking of the jungle hut, you know, this, these are small family groups originally. You know, if we go back to the seminal time of humans coming into South America and the Isthmus and, and, and the Yucatan, semi-subterranean igloos, bomas with a, with a lid. And, you know, keeping the, the riffraff out, keeping the heat and, and the family in. And, and so how did that work? Well, dad is going out and then, I, you know, it's division of labor. It's not sexist by any means, but so, so the, the men are going out to, to the hunt, the uncles and the father going out to the hunt. And they're bringing back jungle animals, monkeys, quadimundi, tapirs, maybe if they're lucky. And, and the, the, the women are, are doing the foraging nearby the homestead and collecting only the best gourds and the best beans and the best things. They bring them back to the hut. And, it, and, I, and I often use this expression to the, to the crucible of civilization civilization and uh, incidentally uh, an epithet in my uh, lexicon <laughs> but bringing it back to the hut dad comes home with you know some some meat and everybody's hunkered down in the hut around the literal crucible which is the the central fire so you eat you eat them you cook the meat you eat the meat you eat your veggies the bones don't get thrown out the door because that might attract the jaguar and they go in the fire. And overnight, the fire damps down. It, you know, it, the, the flames are gone that you were cooking with. And now it becomes an inf, you know, radiant infrared heat because as the fire dies down with this load of bones that have gone into it, incidentally, the bones being reduced to their constituent parts of calcium, manganese, boron, you know, the little trace elements that are all being gleaned from the garden, from the, from the jungle by the animals are now brought back into the hut and they're in the fire. Uh, meanwhile, the chamber pot is also in there because you're not going out to toilet with the jaguar at night either. So you've got your chamber pot, and you've got your, your central fire with all these bones and stuff that have been deposited in it. The fire is dying down overnight, so it's building up a load of ash on the top. And what's happening is it's creating a reduction reaction in the bottom with whatever wood was at the bottom. And that wood starts to off-gas its volatiles and becomes pure, what we call biochar, which is pure carbon. It's charcoal that has been had everything removed on it because of this slow burn. And as its gases come off and go up through the ash, it actually becomes infrared because as a little bit of oxygen gets down to it, it's burning in the ash. So there's no flame. There's only heat being reduced and CO2 and maybe a little carbon monoxide, but not enough to hurt anybody. So what that's done now is you've created this perfect charcoal in the bottom. And what do we do that with that in our aquariums, in our homes? It removes the nitrates from the water and the nutrients that the fish are defecating and urinating into the water. So in the morning, and this is the human, this is the anthropology part of the program, and it's the human part of the program. Everybody wakes up in the morning and it's teens, do your chores. And what do they do? They move the chamber pot with its lid, because you don't want to be smelling that. You move that over to the fire. You sweep the entire household into the fire. And with that comes broken pottery and skin cells and all the you know, whatever detritus you brought in on your feet, and that gets swept into the fire. And then the fire is lifted out and put into the chamber pot. And what have you done now? What have you created? You've got this perfect, uh, uh, negatively charged biochar with all the little galleries that are within the, the dendritic part of the wood itself. And that goes further down into the minuscule, the micro tubules that are in the carbon itself, all waiting to suck up all that urine and all of those nutrients from the feces. We've already got the bones in there with all these micronutrients. 
And now it's been all amalgamated together. And when the kids take it outside, are they taking it very far? They dump it right on the house. More reinforcement against the Jaguar. Might even stink a little bit, but that's okay because that's going to keep them away too. And then what happens on the house? All of those beautiful seeds that are in your excrement start popping up. And there they go. And now all of the best things that you've gleaned from the jungle are grown on your house. So you don't have to, now you don't have to go hard scrabble out into the jungle and worry about the jaguar. You go pick something off the house. Not only that, now the tapir is coming to your house because you got the best stuff. And so all you got to do there is wait for them. And that moves into domestication of animals and all that other stuff. And you can see how that cultural evolution, and I'm a systems theorist, you know, I know it's cosmological, universal, for, right down to geological here and biological and and, you know, and then we can even get down into the cultural and then even religious and within those little things they are all little microcosms of each other. So now we've got we've got fat and happy people in their hut. Right. What do fat and happy people do? They make culture. They make music. They make dance. They do math. They create the concept of zero in the jungle before they had it over in in, you know, Eastern Europe or 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 Western Asia. So they're doing math and, and this evolves also as we're moving up into the, you know, and so fat and happy people do another thing too. What do they have more of more fat and happy people? And so now you can see how that evo evolution happens. Now you have hut, hut, hut. Now we have too many huts and too many gardens on huts. So you got to go down to the river anyway. So you go to the river where the sun is coming through because there's a break in the canopy and you pile that stuff up. And it's, there's no waste. There's no concept of waste. You know, this isn't, and, and arche, my archaeology co colleagues, well, I don't know about today, but in my career, still call them the garbage midden. You know, the refuse piles. Applying teleologically our culture, on, projecting it onto them. And what I'm trying to tell everybody and today, and when I go to my, you know, see my graduate students and so forth. And I'd say hey, those are gardens. And so that evolution uh, went on through my career until we had complete deforestation of the rainforest and satellite in imagery at the end of my career. And what did we learn? Nazca lines. Yeah, they were out on the plains in Peru, the Altiplano. They were in the jungle too, under the canopy where nobody could see them. How did they do that? They did it with math. They did it with sight lines and you can see it today. Ditch and berm, ditch and berm. Cause when the tide went out during the dry season, they did a channel up to the house and now there's a berm and a clung, a, a, a canal. And when the tide comes up, you still had a ridge that you could walk on and deposit your material and it's growing in trees. And once they got it started, it bioaccumulated. So that evolution then ends up to, at the end of my career, you can see it and it goes to the horizon. Not only does it go into the horizon, but there are places where the toucan has been made over a square mile with perfect arcs in its bill and its tail and its wings. And its eyeball is the cenote, the sacred cenote spring where the water comes from in the middle of the jungle and where you might bury your dead. So there's a religious implication there too. So speaking of water, right. Um, I was wondering if you can kind of discuss um, the connection between water quality and permaculture, right. Um, and maybe, you can, and then maybe you can start off by talking about that with uh, your discussion about the Florida lawn, um, about the modern conception of the lawn and uh, how that iteration and, and the problems of that iteration, um, as opposed to kind of a more holistic approach that uh, you're talking about with permaculture. Well, here, the evolution of the lawn, we can talk about too. And I, I don't know how deeply you want to get into that, but why do we have a patch of grass in front of our house that we don't golf on, we don't picnic on, and it's purely for show to our neighbors, which comes right out of feudal 
you know, medieval <laughs> Europe and, and, uh, and wealth displays conspicuous consumption and displays of wealth. I, you know, I can afford to do this and, or my, I have sheep grazing or I have serfs taking care of it. Uh, so we, we have that. And, and of course it's, it's ridiculous uh, to, I, I cannot use my well water to fill my pool today or it will turn green Im immediately because of the fertilizer that's run, running down through it. And the permaculture solution for that is raise the lawnmower to as high as it will go and just cut whatever you have and creates the floor, what I call the Florida mosaic landscape. All those weeds, which are, you know, some invasive, some, some natives, uh, spurges and other things. In front of my house, my meadow has all the colors of the rainbow at different times of the year, uh, different pink flowers, blue flowers, et cetera, et cetera. 26 years here, 15 years at my previous place, never put any kind of nothing in a bag on any of it. Um, you know, and, and just like my food forest demonstration, which is 11 years uh, down at the Unitarian Church, my home has been a demonstration for 26 years longer than I've been a permaculture designer. I've only added all these layers of food more recently. And I do some Blackwater stuff that I can't really talk about, uh, you know, but I've uh, been doing that for 26 years too. My entire house, I never contribute anything to a central sewage disposal system. I take care of my business right here on my property and I feed my fruit trees. And that's a convoluted system also. But back to the lawn idea and, and water quality. At Beacon Food Forest Gardens, we have never put, they, they have never used any kind, any Roundup, no herbicides, no pesticides, nothing of any kind. Anything that comes out of that garden and out of that food forest is absolutely organic. The water quality in the dry retention pond, yes, the dry retention pond is there for water quality purposes required by the state to catch the runoff from the parking lot so that transmission fluid and motor fuel, motor fuels and motor oils and stuff don't make it to the bay quickly. Fortunately, at this facility, they only ever paved less than half of the area, so most of it's in Baha'i grass, which incidentally we stopped irrigating, and it does just fine. You know, Baha'i grass will dry down in the during the summer, but doesn't go away. You can still drive over it, and as soon as it rains, now you're mowing twice a week instead of once a month. So, you know, there's there's the the easy way. To eliminate the pollution is to ignore it, to ignore the products on the shelf and leave them there. Um, also, in the garden, we found that, you know, there's plenty of phosphorus in Florida sands all over the place. And if we, <clears throat> if we use Tithonia diversifolia, the Bolivian sunflower, it bioaccumulates phosphorus in its foliage and in its stalks and in its flowers. And we can use that as our phosphoric fertilizer, and all of a sudden we don't need phosphate. And all those surveys that I did for all the iterations of mining companies that all conglomerated into Mosaic is superfluous. We don't need to take the little Manatee River and dig it down to 60 feet. I'm sorry, I get angry about it. But you know, we don't need that. We don't need all this water you know, in, in settling ponds now that are flowing into Tampa Bay and destroying it. Uh, we can simply chop and drop that stuff. I drive over it in my, in my driveway so it doesn't sprout up when I, just, when I use it as mulch under my other plants. And so everything that we need and the whole permaculture idea, especially with the water quality, and incidentally, there's other things like Moringa oleifera, the miracle tree of India. It's got all the essential amino acids that we need for life in its leaf. It grows like a weed here in Florida. It's probably an exotic on the IFAS list. 
but you can take six of the seeds, chew them up, spit them into a two liter, flattened out two liter bottle you find in the driveway, blow that bottle up, put in puddle water, shake it up and sit it in the sun. It's a flocculant, it's antibiotic, and it will absolutely precipitate out all solids in that water and you can decant pure drinkable water from it. So water quality, you know, of course it's best to keep the, the rain pure as it goes into the land and lets the plants further filter it. That's what I'm doing with my black water system, a phytofiltration system. Yeah, that, the, the, the effluent that comes out of my secondary, out of my two-stage septic system is, you know, it's anaerobic at the front end of that septic tank. You don't want that. It's septic when it gets into the second, there's coliform in there, comes out into the di distribution tank, and then it goes default to my fight over mediation pond around my banana circle. The bananas are being fed, my orange trees are getting it by proxy as they send their roots down, and then I can dip that out and go pour it around my landscape onto my plants. And you know, I'm not putting it on my broccoli, but on any of my plants that have calm, my bananas or a fruit that are, you know, aerial, then I, I pour it on their roots. So, you know, uh, water quality begins at home and it shouldn't end there. It should go out to every water course. In permaculture, we like watersheds to divide things, not these arbitrary blocks and squares and state lines and everything. That's the way the Native Americans did it. You know, they followed water courses. And those water courses, if we stopped, you know, suckling at the teat of petrochemical fertilizers and poisons, we could solve all the problems. You know, Mollison said, you know, the problems of the world are very complex, but the simple, the, the, but the solutions are embarrassingly simple. And they are. We can deprive them of the oxygen of our commerce and, and it will restore itself. When after, uh, you know, they were doing this agroforestry when Columbus landed to the horizon. And by that time, by 1492, they already had it going on. There were causeways moving between every major metropolitan place in North and South America and everywhere in between and trade networks where, you know, we excavate lead ore from Arkansas here in, in Florida. We get copper from Michigan. We get green stone from the, the Ohio Valley. And it turns up with amazing regularity. They had it going on here, much better than anything that was going on in, in Europe, where they were living with their animals below decks, exchanging diseases, smallpox, and, you know, all of that. And when Columbus sneezed in Hispaniola, it started the pandemic here. So that when the, it's the second and third voyages and the other explorers came, they went right past what had been reclaimed agroforestry. And they didn't recognize it as food. They were looking for hedgerows and sheep. So they didn't know that, you know, and, and moreover, all of those great civilizations had already declined and collapsed when the Spanish showed up. And that's what we don't get in our history books. They had collapsed and they were tearing down their temples to build battlements against their neighbors because they had gotten too top heavy. The pyramid in the, in the city was invert in society, drawing from those gardens and all harvest all the time. And when they started sending the armies who march on their stomachs to get too much, they said, no. We're going to walk into the jungle and you guys can fight it out among yourselves. And they did. And by the time the Spanish showed up, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and they've got steel and horses and stuff. So they didn't recognize this agroforestry that was going on in the jungle that I've now replicated here in my suburban jungle lot in my Pinellas County, the most urbanly dense. And I've been doing it for 26 years here and 15 years before. And we've been doing it for 11 years at Beacon. and. It can, it's absolutely doable. And without a cent, by the way, over at Beacon Food Forest Gardens, 11 years, not a dime has changed hands. All egalitarian, 
pure gift economy and some pretty good water in that pond too. So um, would you mind elaborating more on what you mentioned about how the Native Americans kind of based their, I think we've said their cities on waterways, right? And then um, maybe you can, and then may, and, um, if you can kind of contextualize that of the way that maybe urban planning can start doing that more and what I'm not. Oh, so. yeah. Well, you know, uh, this evolution from the total egalitarian, when I said the sweet spot, the sweet spot, did it come to an end with man's inhumanity to man eventually? You know, brother against brother is a long-standing uh, you know theme, but for the most part, and certainly here in Florida, the Calusa, you know, and, and everybody knows about the Seminole because they're the most recent, and and they, and they are refugees from the Seminole Wars that finally made it, did not capitulate and go out west in the Trail of Tears and went into the. And so most people are only familiar with that recent history. But the deeper history is that there, will, there were little city states all around Florida. The Tocobaga were here in Pinellas County where I am. Uh, uh, further over to the, to the east were the IES, AIS. Uh, they, they were a little enclave right over on the coast because the Calusa were the baddest men in all the land. They were at Mound Key uh, in Estero and Pine Island in that area, but their influence went all up again, river courses. Uh, they went interior to the, to the Kissimmee and then up the Kissimmee, up almost to Orlando and took tribute from there. But again, along natural water courses because that was also transportation corridors. Easier to move, uh, you know, 30 deer from Ocala, or not Ocala, from uh, Osceola County down to Lee County and, you know, that area, if you put them on your canoe and get them down there, you know. Um, coastally, of course, then it's, it's a much different story. But again, uh, you know, the evolution of from the archaic period, you know, three, five thousand years ago up to these city states. And again, that's a progression and a natural evolution. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, for example, at Weedon Island, they found a, what they're calling a canoe. And I really think it was a pontoon 40 feet long. And that made it easy to get from from Pinellas County across to Tampa and then get everything that's coming down the Hillsborough River or the Alafia River. So the Tocobaga uh, area is also centered around these water courses, but also coastally. And, and early on in that archaic period, there, you know, there was, you know, you don't want to be at the beach in the wintertime. So there'd be a migration seasonally, interior, exterior, you know, coastal and interior. And these all follow water courses. And then if you go up a little bit farther north to the Anclote, and then you start getting to the boundary between the Alachua, who didn't get along with the Tocobaga, such that when DeSoto ended up here, they said, oh, you want to go up and the gold and the corn is up with the Alachua people. Yeah, get them out of Dodge, right? So, um, yeah, water courses were highways, but they were also borderline, borderlines, borderlands. But uh, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but what do you think the relationship is though between the way what what can modern what what can modern um, cities and urban systems and um, and for the and urban people learn about how to deal with water quality and improve water quality from these indigenous groups if you believe there is a lesson to be learned. Well, and that's if you believe if there's any. I don't know. You know, we we have we have paved over and channelized and and culverted all of our little tributaries to people don't even know about them. You know, it's all it's 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 just like the sewer. You flush it and you forget it. You don't even know it's down there. So storm drains that you know run right with the sewer lines and so forth. They're out of sight and out of mind. You know, there's no wildlife 
available for you to enjoy in those if you're not afraid of it, you know, and many of us are are imports from the north, so we don't like seeing the lizards, you know, and certainly not a palmetto bug. So, um, yeah, I think the disconnect there from nature, it, you know, is it restorable? I don't know that it is. You know, I don't think we're going to go dig up and, and we're channelizing our our tributaries till now, you know, at some point I fully expect to see, you know, a, a, a Los Angeles river style culvert system that's already, I see snaking its way in smaller water courses, uh, like what used to be the, uh, there used to be a little barge canal that they started here, but, but abandoned in Pinellas County. And so they're doing these box culvert style things and why because they need to channel that hurricane water away and as they accumulate water weeds and so forth well they get channeled away right away too and now you've got your you've got your uh freshwater aquatics going into the halide environment and they die and turn into what you know nutrients to feed red tide so if there is a lesson to be learned from the indigenous people is to nurture nature groom it to suit your need, which they did, of course, so that they could navigate. You know, if a, if a tree fell across the stream, they would absolutely remove it. So if there is a lesson to be learned, I think the best lesson would be to let everything revert to its natural state. Uh, naturally, our challenge would be to remove such things as melaleuca and and all the all the things that have been brought here through our agency that we then demonize and project our animosity onto as invasive exotics there is nothing more invasive exotic or destructive than us forever and now we bring in the cuban tree frog and we look him in his little red eyes and say up oh, Got to put the got to put the the lidocaine on you and put you in the freezer. When we're the problem, you know, and there are the innocents. Just like I, you know, I'm 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 a white European, you know, a mongrel American in Florida, and I have no more right to be here than that than that. Uh, and actually, the Cuban tree frog maybe has more of a right to be here, in my opinion. But I'm in the minority. I realize that I'm an outlier. But, but your question, if I, if I was to lend any wisdom from, of the ages from our Native American forebears, it would be recognize that you are, are part of nature. Maybe, you know, and maybe an integral part, but not above the other animals or, or below them but an equal. And if we look at all of the community as equal, and then those that are starting to not be equal, like Brazilian pepper or melaleuca or some of the other things that would choke those waterways, then that's where our husbandry can come in. And we can make, we can make the environment better for the community. And by being a part of the community and working to make the community better, we better it for ourselves. And so that's what we've been doing over at Beacon Food Forest Gardens. And I'm here to tell you that if you do that and you just groom it and, and not think of things as how is it useful to me, but just recognize that there is inherent utility in every, every aspect of every individual in the community and that the more diverse the community is, and this is absolutely true. The more diverse the community, the more resilient the community. Because if, if one of the things gets damped down, the other takes its place. If the ground gets scoured and broken, the Spanish needles are there to fill that spot almost instantly. And that is the plant that gets more roundup in Florida than any other because people hate it. it. Gets those little stickers that stick in my socks. And it grows so it grows rampantly. Yeah, like, like we have. It's a medicine. It's a superfood. 
And it's a pioneer plant that heals the earth as soon as you scratch it. And we want to spray around that upon it because it gets those stickers in our socks. And that's what we're teaching over at Beacon and what my mission is in opening up my home so that others might come and see it and say, hey, I, I like this and I could have this at my house. And then I put my young 20 something following with those people to sit you know, around my natural swimming pool. Here's some water quality for you. No chlorine in my swimming pool. Phytoremediation, two pot system. Pump the water into my, my tank with my papyrus and my lotus and my lilies and my iris. Takes every bit of nitrogen out of it, making it pure, clear spring water. Natural pool conversion interest group on Facebook. You can see me sitting in it with Gambusia Hillbrook eye swimming through my beard. And, you know, so water quality begins at home. And it begins by, uh, it, can't, it could begin by doing a composting toilet if we could get our minds around that. And, and uh, you know, urine diluted 10 to 1 can go straight onto your garden. There's nothing poisonous in your urine, unless, of course, you're poisoning yourself. You know, I mean, there might be some, some birth control estrogens and stuff in there. But nature can take care of that. You know, the community can take care of the mycelium. The mycelial network in the mulch can take care of that. It can, it can combine with the carbon of the mulch to make a beautiful soil. You know, I mean, yeah, the solutions are exquisitely simple. So um, you mentioned Rent Tide. Um, I was wondering if you can kind of talk about your experiences of that over the course of your lifetime. Oh, and, boy. Uh, um, and then what do you think can be done at the local level to kind of remedy that? And most importantly, who is yes. responsible for that? When I was 13 years old, I got a special permit to go remove dead fish from the canals all over. It was the first red tide that I had experienced in my lifetime. And what year is this? Um, uh, 73, uh, thir no, uh, 13 years old, 1968. Okay. That's 67 or 68, we had a red tide here. And we went down and pitchforked fish and, you know, and I mean, we didn't put a dent in it then. Um, and they're not putting a dent in it now, really, uh, <clears throat> you know. Uh, it's going to the landfill. They, sh they have shown us some little harvesting device and shown us doing a tip on the floor over at the resources to energy plant. I think that was showboating a little bit because most of it has sand in it and they're not dumping a bunch of beach sand into that incinerator. That's all going to the landfill. But yeah, Karenia brevis used to be gymnodinium brevis, but you know, some graduate student got a hold of it and put his, put a different name, his girlfriend's name on it or something, Karenia. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, dinoflagellate, does it, you know, does it eat those nutrients? It's not really uh, photosynthetic, I don't think. It's an orange cyano deal. Um, and, and again, I'm not an expert in, in, in uh, invertebrate zoology, but I do think that when you, when any time you create an imbalance in the system, you create, you create the atmosphere for the fluorescence of bad actors. And so, uh, I do believe that that are, uh, and oh, and, and by the way, I was raised as a plumber. And what I know is that on Valentine's Day, nineteen ninety-five, I was out in my kayak in my largest estuary creek uh, right near my home in Pinellas County, the Allen's Creek, out trying to catch that snook as big as my leg uh, in two feet of water. I saw a spring. I said, oh, a spring. Oh, a spring. Yeah. A spring with uh, creamer cups and condoms and tampon applicators were coming out of the spring. Gray water. And this was at a time when Pinellas County was trying to figure out where, where's this coliform coming in the, in the creek. And they actually, uh, well, you know, said it was dog poo on the curbs and they condemned people's houses by eminent domain and did retention ponds to solve that problem. And really it was what it ended up with this particular one ended up being was a cast iron force main that was going from a city of Largo lift station 
under the creek over to US 19 so that it could go by gravity to the next to the next place. And I got on the phone and I called the county and I said, how many river crossings are there in Pinellas County? And they sloughed me off and I was persistent. I kept coming back. I said, I want to know about this one that I just found out about. And I made, you know, and I got vocal about it. And the, the city of Largo sent Gus out. He opened up the lid of the, of the lift station, said, look, lift station's working good. All good. No problem. Meanwhile, that pipe was broken out in the middle. And I found out from Pinellas County that they are scoped for 18 years and then they got to be replaced. And this one had been in the ground for almost 40 years. And then I watched as the EPA got involved. I got a hold of, of uh, Baywatch, Tampa Baywatch, because I could, I was just a little guy. They weren't even answering my questions at the county. But when Peter Clark got on it, they got on it. And now they had the city of Largo did a coffer dam out in the middle of that river. And they pumped it. They couldn't get it pumped down, but they put a diver down in it. And now I'm the plumber, fly on the wall, just a neighbor kind of saying, hey, what's going on? I'm a plumber. You're a plumber. I'm a plumber. Hey, buddy. And I'm getting all the information. And I see the guy come up and he's got basically what we call no hub bands, a stainless steel band that they were going to put a band, a literal band aid on it. And then he comes up and he says, this ain't going to work because it's at a flange that broke and slipped. So it's a mechanical joint that had broken and slipped and is spewing it at like hell won't have it. So then they'd had to do a $16 million bond issue and do a directional bore under the river and replace it. One guy in a kayak. And so, uh, that is probably rife throughout Pinellas County. I went down to talk to the uh, legislative uh, commission that came down to spank Rick Kreisman uh, a couple of years ago when they had that 2 million gallons that went out into the bay. I waited for every public comment to have their say. I took the, the mic the la as the last person and I said, my name's Jay Hardman, I'm, uh, you know, uh, career archaeologist, native son of Pinellas. I've come home to roost and I got a solution for the pervious uh, infrastructure. It, and, um, and if anybody wants to talk to me about it, and I did a mic drop and, and Rick Kreisman got his, his director of public works tankersley to, to go see him. Uh, Mayor of the city of, of St. Pete Beach, the environmental director for the city of Largo, all congregated around me and Channel 8 News. And I did a little bit, you know, this little three second segment on, on the news. And the solution was this. I could provide them with the people who know how to make a scalable demonstration of a pyrolytic reaction that could take urban yard waste and put it in a retort and reduce it to biochar and use the waste heat to heat the cake that's coming, the solids that are coming out of the, the treatment plant to heat those solids that they're now using a pipe coming in with natural gas, paying for the gas to come in and heat the cake so they can dry it out, put it on tractor trailers, and pay more money to ship it to Polk County, where they pay a tip fee to dump it. And what they could do is instead of lightening it with gas, they could use the waste heat from the pyrolytic reaction, which is also making syn gas. The syn gas can then go out the pipe that the gas was coming in, heat the cake with the, with the waste heat. And once the cake is heated, the cake goes into the retort and is cooked to make more biochar. But Jay, what about jobs, jobs, jobs? What about all those salaries and 401ks and insurance for all those truck drivers that are driving that stuff? Oh, and incidentally, they're driving the urban yard waste over the Skyway down to Manatee County to get rid of it because they can't give it back to us quickly enough. And they're sending the liquid effluent to us in the purple pipe 
to spray on our lawns because the solution to pollution is dilution and they can't dump that in the bay because the EPA won't have it. So the problems are huge. The sol solution is simple and here's the solution and no loss of jobs, jobs, jobs. Once you burn the yard waste and make char, and now you're burning the actual human excrement and making char, you have a lot of biochar building up, but you also have the purple pipe that's treated liquid effluent. That's urine. So you charge the biochar with the nitrogen and you have a perfect agrochemical fertilizer that goes back in those trucks and now, instead of paying money for gas to come in, you got gas going out that you're getting a revenue stream from. You've got an agro product that you now have a revenue stream that's available to come in from. And so now you put it in those trucks and you pay for salaries and motor pools and fuel and all that with the revenues that you get from selling that product instead of phosphate from Mosaic. How does that sound to you? Sounds like an incredible solution. <laughs> wow. And I, and I have a friend who was ready to do all that, but in municipalities, you can't get an inroad. Just like I couldn't pick up the phone and call my county and say, hey, I want some information. Well, who the hell are you? Well, if you can't grease a campaign fund, nobody's going to touch that tar baby with a 10-foot pole because everything's working fine the way it is right now, and I'm getting my salary. And my campaign's going just fine because the people that are making money are financing my campaign. So why do I want to rock the boat and have something come burping back on me? If I say no, the culture of no is great because you never have to talk to that person again. But it was ready to go and nobody wanted it. So that being said, and you did kind of touch on this a little bit earlier, but uh, what do you think are the major shortcomings in the way the city of St. Petersburg manages water and environmental quality? And uh, how do you think is the best way to approach these potential issues? Or uh, I, I think they manage, I think they manage the press is their biggest problem and they don't try to manage. Yeah, they, they're, they're working to try and not have front page news. I mean, so they are moving, but the idea of injecting our effluent into deep aquifers and then, and then paint that, polish that turd and greenwash it by saying, oh yeah, but we're gonna displace the, the, the saline that's coming in. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're replacing it with tidy bowl. You know, I mean, it's insane. And, and I realize it's a big problem. They don't have a solution. You know, the solution to pollution is dilution and we, we got too much pollution and there's nothing to dilute it anymore. So yeah, it's a big problem. And there is a there, you know, it's it's a technological problem. And our challenge is to come up with that technological solution and actually implement it. But we can't get past that because of the polit politics. And most of the politics is surrounding making sure that I look like a good guy at the end of the day and that nobody gets any dirt on me or that any of this bad stuff that's going to happen doesn't burp back on me. So. Um, yeah, uh, I don't. I, I I don't have a solution for it because it's 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 so tied up in the in the political, and and then the public, of course, is disinterested. They don't vote. They're, you know, they're they, they, you know they're more they're more pocketbook oriented themselves. So it's it, the whole problem goes back to greed, and the egalitarian solution that we have is 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 great. And can we attract enough from the margins to make that get bigger than the other? You know, I'm a, I'm a realist. I'm doing my part, and I know that there will be little enclaves so that if we do have a stepped collapse and, we, and, and the, the poop plant breaks down, then we'll have a few young people who say, hey, I know a thing that I learned over here. And this guy's doing this thing where he just does it all on his property, and it does pretty good. So that's what I hold out for. And that's why I, you know, at 66 years old and getting a little frail and feeble and got some medical issues, you know, my passion, my passion drives me to, uh, to persevere. 
And then uh, finally, last question I'll ask you is uh, the term sustainability kind of gets thrown around a lot. And I was wondering if, if you can define what that means to you. And then, um, yeah, I have, I have, I have, I have deep six, the whole idea of sustainability in favor of something else because sustainable, again, we, we think in language. And so if we say it's sustainable, that means we can keep it the way it is, right? Well, the way it is, is wrong. We don't want to keep it this way. So I have moved to regenerative. We need to regenerate the planet around us. We need to make it better. We need to augment. So sustain means to keep it status quo in my mind. And if we change the language, we can change our minds and we can change the public's mind if we can interject it. And it's, you know, slow and small solutions is one of the permaculture pr principles moving from pattern to detail. So we establish the pattern and then we work on the details of how we make implement it and make it work. One of the biggest things that I'm excited about now is I've met a, a guy who worked for the Buccaneer organization. And he came to the Beacon Food Forest because he was trying to come up with some ideas where they could demonstrate some, some regenerative practices over at the stadium. And I thought, oh, yeah, well, they're trying to get some, some community gardens starting up over there so they can say, oh, look at us. Look how, look how good we are. But it occurred to me and I said to him, I said, look, if we're going to do something, why don't we make it real? Why don't we uh, show them ways that they can create a big retention pond and just take the urinals to start with or whatever? So uh, and that way, I think that we can we can go to the popular culture around politics. Because, you know, an organization like the NFL and now he's talking to folks over at Daytona, uh, you know, that is a way because they have the money, they have the incentive. And if we can bring those football player uh, fans in the stands around to this idea, then we move the politics with the populace because the market will speak and the politicians will recognize that too. But as far as uh, the city of St. Pete and I, I, I can't really say that I have a lot of hope for it the way it is. I, I, you know, I like the idea that it's moved. It's become a much more progressive city. Young people have flocked there in their number uh, because of, of, you know, the implementations that, that Rick Kreisman has made, quite frankly. Uh, I'm hopeful for the next mayoral election, which is coming up. And that's, you know, that continues socially, uh, environmentally, uh, you know, it really is a great thing. I think St. Petersburg is doing a great thing. If that will translate to urban agriculture and translate to retrofitting uh, the infrastructure, and if the whole infrastructure idea takes hold nationally, that will be a boon. So, you know, I, I want to be hopeful. Uh, you know, I, I started out a pessimist as, as a young man in anthropology and, and actually, uh, you know, decided not to have children myself and took drastic measures. Not that I regret them. I fostered and I have any number of children that I take on programs and I'm going to be doing a school program here in October for young people. They grow up and they're influenced. And uh, so that's where I find my hope. And, and hopefully we, we create the leaders of tomorrow from uh, this resource of young, young people and children. You know, they're low-hanging fruit. Those young people that have been attracted to St. Petersburg because it's the green city and there's murals and all that, that's all excellent because that makes it a hub. I liken the whole regenerative movement to the mycelial network. You and I are right now using the internet that's the mycelium. When we create something like Beacon Food Forest or My Place, or we do an event somewhere and everybody comes to it, that's a fruiting body. That's a mushroom. All the people that come to that because they have some vague interest and they get it and they, you know, they drink the Kool-Aid, they become spores and they sporulate and they go back to their homes and they went, oh, I went to this Beacon Food Forest 
gardens and it was awesome. And I ate jackfruit and kiwis and lychees and tamarinds right here in the city. Oh, and I went to the bathroom outside. And then they talk about the composting toilet and they speak in muted tones, but it's kind of cool. And that's how I think we can shift regenerative shift away from what we're doing with attraction. And the attraction is what? It's this community that's hopeful and moving in the right direction and doing cool stuff and eating great fruit and, and organic vegetables that they're making and cost no money. We're empowering ourselves economically, spiritually, and we're eating damn good. And we're doing it all together and we're laughing and smiling and slinging poi and doing drum circles and static dance and all that stuff. And that's what I'm attracting now is those young people. And I'll give them whatever they, whatever they want to do. Come up and just be in, the, be in the scene and osmose it a little bit and then take that with you back and create it where you are. I think that's the way we do it. Grassroots, literally. Absolutely. Um, so then, um, do you have any final thoughts, any um, ideas that you want to kind of go over um, before we close out this interview? Any last kind of words of advice? Words of uh, advice well, ideas? one of the hopeful things that I see happening now also, which I was trying to initiate myself, but now it's happened naturally, is here in Pinellas County. I have a dear friend, Mallory Foster, now Mallory Babjack, because she married a, another friend. Uh, who used to be the IFAS food security coordinator for our local extension. She started a uh, uh, hummingbird hideout, uh, off, not off grid, but a communal living food forest lot in, in Gulfport. But now she's married to Stefan Babjack, who worked at Wil uh, Wilcox Nursery, which was the premier native plant nursery in Pinellas. And he was their Nate, uh, native installation coordinator. They've now joined forces in marriage, but also in business in something called Wise Hands. And they are going around planting only natives and food crops in people's yards. And they're attracting some of these young people that I'm sending protégés to work with them. And I think that that will take, take hold and people will start reducing their lawn print and increasing their food print and their native pollinator print. And so that's very hopeful. And I'm hopeful that that will snowball and I'm encouraging it as much as I can. And I'm actually giving away the plants so that people can do that. So I think, you know, that the most hopeful things for me right now are all the people that have been coming to Beacon for a free giveaway that I've been doing on Monday, on Wednesday and Saturdays since fe last February, just come and take stuff. Uh, because we have it in abundance and we, you can't, even, you won't even, you go in there and you wouldn't even miss it. So, uh, you know, young mothers who come to me going, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm juggling the, I got the plate in the air about my, my homeschooling and my zooming to work. And am I going to keep my house and my banking? And, but now I'm here on a Saturday morning. Cause I got to learn how to cook. I got to need to learn how to grow some food because I'm worried. And the first thing I can tell them is your kids are never going to starve because that Biden's Alba, uh, that, that Spanish needles is edible. It's, it's tastes like spinach. When you cook it, you can put it in the salad, blah, blah, blah. I'll show you three other weeds. And then I've got chaya and I've got moringa that all you have to do is take this cutting, dig a hole, stick it in the ground and keep watered. It'll take off for you. And you've got 46% protein in the chaya. You got all your nutrients in your moringa, and you're going to be fine. And you and I watch the the stress drain out of them, and that's attractive. You know that kind of thing, I think, is what will shift the program. And it's young people, and especially, you know, maybe not the very youngest, maybe not the twenty somethings, but once they start having their children, then opinions shift, and urgencies become more urgent. And I think that's that's the way that we can. And we can shift the paradigm that and the empowerment of women. And, and that's the most really societally, globally, I think, you know, we see a little pushback in, in enclaves, you know, what's going on with the Taliban now or whatever. But the world in general, and certainly the United States is moving more toward the empowerment of women. 
And I'm also fostering that as much as I can. Uh, you know, the women have always saved the babies and kept our society going in spite of a patriarchy that is 12,000 years long. And that's a whole other story that I'd have to get into another time. But there's a reason, you know, why our books all talk about uh, sweat of your brow and, and so forth. And there's also a reason why Jews, Christians, and Muslims all self-identifying as the children of Abraham kill each other over details in their latest book. So the re-empowerment of women is shifting that equation back to an earth mother. And, and those women have kept us going in spite of menfolk. And that's, a, and that's a good thing if we can lift them up, which is why maleness even stayed in the genetics of our any population. And that's a deep evolutionary concept, but expressed as humans. So, yeah, I guess, I guess that was a long final thought <laughs> and rambling. No, um, it was absolutely great.